chapel today uh, on October the 10th 2023 we're delighted to have you today and welcome those who are watching us online we're privileged today to have Dr. Philip Ham with us he is the senior pastor at Palmetto First Baptist Church he's been there since 2011 no stranger to the Baptist College of Florida in fact his son Jonathan is going to be graduating he hopes this year at least and uh, uh, but uh, Dr. Ham holds the bachelor's and master's degrees from Southeastern Seminary and his D-men from Gordon-Conwell, uh, where he studied under Haddon Robinson in the area of preaching. He is married to his high school sweetheart, wife Christy, and they've been married uh, uh, several years now, amen, since 1996. They have three kids, and uh, he published a book entitled Stop 
agreeing with Jesus and start obeying him in 2022. And we're just delighted that you're here, Philip, one of the great preachers in our state and one of the wonderful pastors we're privileged to have come and visit our campus and preach for us. We uh, have a night of worship coming up Thursday night at seven o'clock. Our preview day is Friday, amen. And missions conference next week. So the next week at BCF is gonna be incredibly powerful and exciting. So clue in and stay involved. Of course, our international mission board's asking us to pray for the South Asian peoples and the conflict in Israel. I know we have a couple of different Florida Baptist pastors who are a friend of our school, Alan Brumback from First Naples and Zach Terry from First Fernandino Beach have groups in Israel. They've asked us to pray for them. I understand they both have seats and opportunities to get out now and so uh, we're praying for their safe return and just praying for uh, Jerusalem. Would you pray with me today? Father, we worship you. We love you. We are in awe of you. Thank you that you would send your son to shed his blood for our souls so we could be saved. We pray you'd manifest your presence in this chapel today, that you'd touch our hearts and inspire us, challenge us, that you'd bless and anoint Dr. Ham as he preaches the word to us. May this worship be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
we're going to sing that chorus just one more time.
that's our belief. Lord, that you're the God who never fails, Lord. Lord, we trust in your steadfastness. You're unwavering in all your ways, Lord. You are so faithful. We're so, so incredibly grateful, Lord, for all that you are and what you do for us, Lord. Lord, we just love you. We extol you. We honor you and glorify you in everything, Lord. To you be the glory and the honor forever. We love you and pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Well, I want to give some mad props this morning to doomsday preppers. I am so impressed with how prepared these guys are. For any and every situation, they are ready. But as I, I read articles about them, as I watch documentaries about them, I think maybe they, they get distracted from the main goal every once in a while. Take, for example, a guy named Norman Fellers. Norman was so convinced that the world was going to end at midnight, 1999, with something called Y2K, that he built a bunker in his house, and at the waning hours of 1999, he entered that bunker and sealed himself in that bunker for 14 years. How disappointed was Norman when he walked out of that bunker in the year 2014? And then there's the guy, his name is Tim Rouson, and he was, the, he was the star of National Geographic's uh, creatively titled show, Doomsdayers. He uh, was out shooting his guns, getting ready for the, the final event of the world, and somehow managed to shoot his thumb off. I don't even know, how do you do that on accident? And then down from my part of the country, down in, in Tampa, there was the Otter River Boys. And, and those guys, man, they were so convinced of their biblical view of eschatology. They were so convinced of their biblical understanding of how the end was going to come that they hoarded all the guns and all the ammunition, all the bomb-making materials that they could get their hands on. You know, just like Jesus told us to do. I think sometimes as we start considering the end of the age, the end of time, the second coming of Jesus, I think sometimes we get a little distracted from what Jesus wanted us to pay attention to. And Bible prophecy is one of the most interesting topics in all of Scripture. It's probably the one that has garnered more interest than all the other topics put together. Even people who don't follow Jesus or believe the Bible want to know what the Bible has to say about how it's all going to end. But it's also probably the one of the topics we understand the least about. It's the one that is shrouded in most mystery, one that is the biggest and, and most vague of all the things the Bible talks about. I mean, think about the way the Bible describes the, the end of the ages with phrases like bowls of wrath, horsemen. It talks about lakes of fire. Talks about dragons and beasts, and then my personal favorite, the whore of Babylon. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's symbolic, it's allegorical. And, and as I read these things, I, I look at them and I think, God, you can be clearer than this if you wanted to. In fact, Lord, when you wanted us to know some things, and you were very able to make them clear. Just for example, when God wanted us to know that we weren't supposed to commit adultery. He said pretty clearly, don't commit adultery. When, when God said, I don't want you to murder people, he, he said pretty clearly, I, I don't think you should murder people. There was no vagueness. There was no mystery. There was no smoke. There was no allegory. There was no symbolism. It was just clear, straight talk as I read the Bible it's almost like he doesn't want us to know all the details about how it's going to end but that doesn't stop us does it no we sign up in droves for the Bible prophecy conference we read and read books about how the end times are going to unfold we have our charts and our theories and all the years lined up and man are we convicted that we know how it's going to end because by golly it is going to be a post-tribulation rapture or 
or is it a pre-tribulation rapture? Or is, he, is it a mid-tribulation rapture? I can't remember which one it is that we're so convinced of when he's going to return and how it's all going to end. But man, we are convinced that we know. We may even be more convinced and confident than Jesus was when he was on the earth. You know, the interesting thing about Bible prophecy and studying eschatology in the end times is that we can dive deeply into these topics and we can spend hours upon hours and read books upon books and attend seminars and we can really get into studying what the Bible says about these things while at the same time ignoring some of the clear teachings that Jesus talked about, like loving your neighbor forgiving your enemies and sharing the gospel with a world that has no hope. You see, when Jesus talked about end times, when he talked about the second coming, when he talked about eschatology, when when he described these things, he had one main concept he wanted us to know and he wanted us to be ready. What we're going to do is we're going to ask Jesus a question this morning from the passage, and we're going to ask the question the disciples asked. It's the age-old question. Jesus, how do you want us to be ready? Would you take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 24? We're going to look at a few verses in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse number 3. Just to give you a little understanding of the storyline of what's happening since we're jumping into the middle of this book, or actually we're getting to the very end of this book, Jesus is chronologically about two days away from being crucified. With that in mind, he's about five days away from the resurrection. I mean, Jesus is at this point where in my imagination, I see him flipping through his notes because he knows his time is limited, and he's wondering, what have I left to discuss with disciples? What do they need to know before I'm out of here in 48 hours? And I think he gets to this topic about the end of the age. As we get into chapter 24, the first two verses describe for us that as the disciples are walking away with Jesus from the temple, it's almost as like they want to make conversation with him, but they don't have any really good things to talk to him about. So somebody reaches out and they say, "Uh, uh, Jesus, uh, aren't these pretty buildings? Jesus, not having time for frivolous talk at this point in his life, knowing his time is limited, he says, yeah, they're pretty, but they're going to come down. Which leads to verse number 3 of chapter 24. The disciples ask him the same question we're asking him, and it says in chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, verse number 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? Just make a mental note of the last few words of the disciples' question. They're referring to the end of the age. We'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But notice that Jesus is being asked the same question you and I are asking. They're saying, Jesus, what do we have to prepare for? Jesus, what do we need to look out for? Jesus, what do we need to know in order to be ready? And I love the first thing Jesus tells them. He says to them in verse number 4, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead you astray. It's almost like Jesus is saying to them, gentlemen, listen up. I want to make sure you're not distracted. I want to make sure you're not distracted from the main thing. I want to make sure you don't miss what it is that I'm telling you. I, I, I don't want you to go out and, and buy all the guns you can buy. I don't want you to go out and stockpile all the munitions. I definitely don't want you to hoard all the bomb-making materials. The Otter River boys, they're going to need some. I want to make sure you got everything that you need to have, and what you need to have is not all these preparatory things to survive. I want to make sure you're not led astray. Forget the charts, Jesus is saying. Forget the pre's and the posts and the mids and the out. Forget all of those things. This is what I want. I don't want you led astray. There's one thing I want you to focus on. Now, before he gets to that, he eliminates all the other stuff he doesn't want us to care about. He eliminates all the other things he doesn't want us to be distracted by. And so we start in verse number five, verse number six, rather. And if you would, if if you're comfortable doing so, underline a few things as we go through. I'll tell you what to underline, but I think they're important. Or maybe highlight in your tablet some of these things. He says in verse number six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. In my Bible, I've highlighted wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. In my Bible, I've underlined famines and earthquakes. Verse 8, and all these are but the beginning of birth pains. Verse 9, but then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. I, in my Bible, have underlined tribulation and put to death. You know, something to look forward to. Verse 2, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead you astray. Underline false prophets, would you? And because of lawlessness will be increased. And the love of many will go cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I underlined in my Bible the words lawlessness and increased. And then verse number 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. I underlined in my Bible in verse number 14, gospel to the nations. Now, here's what's interesting about these underlined words, and I wanted you to do this because I wanted your eyes to be able to focus on this. Of these, whatever, five or six different things we underline, most of them, I think, are distractions of which we have no control over. And we just kind of look back down at the passage and look at the things you underline. You and I have no control over wars and rumors of wars. We have no control over famines or tribulations. We have no control over what prophets, false prophets say or don't say. We have no control over lawlessness and how it's being increased. There's nothing you and I can do to control these things. And yet, as good Americans, we do our best to control them. I read a stat recently that said that one-third of United States citizens have spent over $11 billion in doomsday prepping material. Why? Because we want to be as prepared as we can for the famine that's coming. We want to be as prepared as we can for the lawlessness that's coming. We want to be prepared. But what I think Jesus is saying is to answer that question about how to be ready and how to be prepared, I think he is removing all these concepts from the table and saying, no, that's not how you're prepared. That's not how you're ready. There's one thing I want you to care about. There's one thing I want you to focus on. There's one thing that you can invest your lives into to be ready for when I return. And that is verse 14. He goes through all the things he doesn't want us to worry about, all the things he doesn't want us to care about. In verse 14, he says, here's where I want your heart to be. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Verse 14 is where we find the answer to the question the disciples are asking. Verse 14 is where we find the answer to the question we're asking. And I'll remind you that question is, Jesus, what do you want us to do to be ready? What do you want us to be about doing to be prepared for your coming? You don't want us hoarding frozen froze dried chip beef in our basement. You, you, don't, you don't want us digging bunkers. What is it that you want us to do, Lord? He says, I want you to care about the eternity of others. The interesting phrase that he uses in verse 14, he, he says that he wants us to share the gospel with the nations. The word for nations is the word ethnos, and it's always intimidating to try to do Greek in front of Greek professors, but I'm going to do my best. The word for ethnos is, is not a word that is describing geopolitical boundaries. It's a word that is describing individual people groups, missiologists will tell us, people groups that have their own language, people groups that have their own cultures, not necessarily nations that have boundaries and borders. For example, the United States has six different ethnos or six different people groups in it. China, for example, has somewhere around 56 or 57 people groups in it, people with their own culture, people with their own language. Jesus is saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to care passionately. When you're getting ready for my return, I want you to care passionately about the eternity of people who don't know me, people who've never heard of me, People who don't have the Bible translated in their own heart language. I want you as you're getting ready for my return. I want you to forget the charts and forget the priests and the posts. And the, I want you to focus and I want you to care about the nations that have never heard my name. Now remember, we're on a timeline within the book of Matthew Within 48 hours, Jesus dies. Within five days, he raises from the dead. And if you turn to chapter 28, there's a passage you're very familiar with, but I want you to pay attention to the closing words of the book of Matthew 
And I want you to listen to the familiarity with the words that we see in chapter 24. Chapter 28, 19, and 20, the last thing Jesus says he wants us to be up to as we get ready for his return is to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And listen to this last part. And behold, I am with you always. And what are the last words? To the end of the age. Let me go back to chapter 24. Do you remember the question? I told you to pay attention to it when the disciples asked it in chapter 24, verse number 3. They said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the what? The end of the age. Jesus is saying, I want you to be ready and to be ready for my return is to do one thing. I want you to care about the eternity of others. I want you to care about the eternity of people who don't know me. I want you to care about the eternity of those who don't and have never heard my name. Right now, to the best of my understanding, there are about 7,000 different people groups around the world who do not have the scriptures translated into their heart language. 7,000 people groups in the world who have never heard who Jesus is. 7,000 people groups in the world who don't have a missionary or a church planted there to tell them of the love of Christ. 7,000 people. And we're distracted with our pre's and our posts and our ahs and our mids. And we're distracted with politics. We're distracted with, if we go through this list, wars and rumors of wars. Famines and earthquakes. Lawlessness in the streets of our big cities. We're distracted with all these different things. And Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. Don't be distracted. There's one thing I want you to care about as you prepare for my return. And that, I want you to care for the eternity of others. Jesus was so passionate about this that he goes on through chapter 24 and he explains in different parables and different allegories and different images just trying to get his disciples and getting us in retrospect to see that of all the things going on to get ready for he says i want you to do this to get ready for me to come back i want you to passionately care about the eternity of others and if you go to chapter 24 verse 42 he wraps up this thought before he tells several more parables about it in chapter 24 verse 42 he says therefore when we see the word therefore in scriptures, we know that it's the equal mark at the end of teachings. We know that it's the, the summation of what has just been taught. Jesus is saying, after everything I've just said, let me, let me just say it to you one more time in a, in, in a quick review. Therefore, he says, stay awake. For you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. And he would not have let this house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be, there it is, ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Verse 45, who then is faithful and a wise servant whom his master has set over his household? That phrase set over means trusted over. Jesus left us and trusted over the household of the world. Our responsibility to share the gospel. And he says in verse 46, wrapping up his thought, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes Jesus how do we get ready for your return do we study more charts do we dig in and try to see what does the invasion of Israel by Hamas mean or by Hezbollah do, 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 do we dig into what's going on in Ukraine Jesus how do we get ready for your return do I need my bunker to be a little bit more watertight here in Florida Lord how do I get ready for your return do we need more freeze draft mad potatoes Lord how do I get ready for your return he says I want you to care about the eternity of others my wife, Christy, and I had the opportunity this summer to spend some time in North Africa with a, a friend of ours who's a professor of missions at another institution. He, he's been working with an unreached people group for over 25 years, a, a group that I'm not even allowed to say out loud for fear of people getting hurt who currently work with them. As we're working with this people group in this particular country, he tells us a story one night about an event that happened many years ago when he first started working with these folks. He said he was way out in the middle of nowhere, and he, his group had come across a sheik, and the sheik befriended him, and the sheik was wealthy according to that nation's definition of wealth, and he had many goats and many 
Many camels and many horses. And, and then our friend describes sitting at his, his, his table eating you know, sheep eyeballs and just all the weird stuff that you imagine happening on the mission field. Our friend did the best he could to share love of Christ with this obviously entrenched Muslim believer. And they just hit up a great friendship and had a kindred heart. A few days later, he was, our friend was getting ready to leave for the airport. And as he was going to leave, he had, he had packed a, a Bible in his book bag that had currently been written and been translated into this man's personal dialect. This man was one of the ethnos. He was one of the people groups that had been unreached. And as he was standing there with all of the armed gunmen the sheik had around him, my friend takes the Bible out and hands it to his new Muslim friend, the sheik. And he says, as he so beautifully could, the gospel about this is the book of truth. This is God's love for a world he created. And this is how God came himself as the Messiah to fix it. The sheik took the Bible and hugged my friend and then told of a story how 10 years earlier he had had a dream of a man from another nation come and bringing him the book of truth. And as my friend told us this story, his his eyes swelled up with tears. And he said, Philip, do you know what the man, the sheik, said to me next? He looked me dead in the eyes and he said, it's been 10 years. What took you so long? See, when Jesus left us, he left us with clear instructions. There's no allegory. There's no symbolism. We need no charts. We need no diagrams. We we need no conferences. He simply said, I want you to care about the eternity of others. Jesus, how do we prepare for your coming? Whether it's tonight or in 10,000 years, Jesus said, care for souls and their eternal destination the way that I care for souls and their eternal destination. So what do we do with this? I believe with all my heart that there are some of you who are wrestling with a call to missions. And that's the last thing that you want to do. Your parents aren't going to be happy about it. The girl you think you're going to marry, she doesn't want to go live in the dark recesses of the world among tribes and peoples and strange customs and eat the eyeballs of sheep. She doesn't want to do that. So you might lose her. And you have a dream for a career. You have a dream of a family and a nice house and a comfortable retirement and you are wrestling with God over a call to mission. I just want to encourage you, surrender to that call. Whatever it is that God wants you to do, whatever it is that God is calling you to, whatever it is you think your life will be better if you do your plan, I promise you, doing and being where God wants you to be is far superior than where you want to be. Jesus gave us clear instructions. He wants us to care about the souls and the eternal souls of those around us. But here's the thing, Floridians. We don't have to always go to the other side of the world to share the gospel with people who've never heard it. See, I, I, I'm, I'm not naive. I recognize that God doesn't call everyone to go and live in a different place in order to share the gospel. And here's the unique thing about where we live. God is bringing the world to us. If we can set aside our our political understanding of borders open and closed and and, and immigration and migrants. We can set aside all the the things of what we think the president should or shouldn't do, who who should be the president next, what he could and should and shouldn't do. We can just set all those things aside and recognize that God is literally bringing the world to us. That right now in our state, there are over 5 million people who are not born and most of them not legally in the United States. We can get past our politics. We can get past our our Fox News-isms, if we can get past all the things that we think should and shouldn't be, we would recognize that if we're going to get ready for Christ's return, he is telling us to have a heart for the eternal value of these people that are next door to us, that are down the street from us. Maybe you're in your own house. Jesus, we asked, how do we prepare for you to come back? 
He says to us this morning, oh, I'm so glad you asked. For the way that you prepare for my return is to care for the eternity of others. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Father God, you are so good to us. You blessed us with the opportunity to hear the gospel in our heart language. You pierced our souls and you convicted us of our sin. You told us of the hope that you gave us on the cross and through the empty tomb that we might know you for all of eternity. And when you left, you gave us very clear instructions. Lord, we recognize there are things in the Bible that you have shrouded in mystery, and it seems like you did it on purpose. But this instruction, oh, it's crystal clear. You said for us to get ready for your return was to care for the eternity of others. Lord, I believe with all my heart there are a few young people in this room who are wrestling with a call to international missions. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to them today how silly it is to wrestle with the creator of the universe over anything. And that today they would shout out mercy. And they would submit to the purpose you put them on this world for. To take the hope of the gospel to a dark planet. Lord, for others in the room, that we might begin to see that you brought the nations to us. We wouldn't just see these folks around us as neighbors or co-workers. We wouldn't see them as people that work in different businesses or restaurants. Or We would see them as men and women with eternal souls for which you died. Because that is your heart. You care for their eternity. And so must we. In your name we pray. Amen.